Yeah, so I'm Johan, I'm the CTO of 37 Coins, and I'll just take you through a few tab tabs I opened basically today. Um, but before that, uh, we have some material here we'll talk about later. I'm super more excited because Gregory is here. Uh, <laughs> so let's see if I can get this done. Um, so the topic today is married wallets. Married wallets, in essence, is nothing more than um, hierarchical, deterministic, multi-state wallets. Um, but they are implemented in um, Bitcoin J, and um, that specific name was chosen by Mike for the design document that he wrote. Just because multi-sig means so many things and can be used in many setups where not necessarily one party is online and there is a user wallet. It could be something like fund management for, uh, for like a company. So I'll take you through uh, what I'm doing, what 37 Coins is doing very quickly, bear with me. Um, then uh, we'll talk about um, a small paper I wrote basically for today just to organize my thoughts. And um, then we will do hands-on and actually write a signer or at least look at a written signer and then execute that signer and publish a multi-sig transaction or spend a multi-sig um, on the test net. And then I'll come back and just bore you until the one an hour is over and then uh, we can have Q&A and go on. Okay, let's get started. Uh, so that's... Well, before you start, um, who's 37 points? How do you guys start up? What's your history? Yeah, I want to... Okay, let me go the other way then. <laughs> um, so, uh, 37 Coins um, is a startup that has been all over the place already. We started in South Korea, we went to Berlin, then we came here to the, uh, to the Valley to go through the Plug and Play Accelerator. Um, it's Jonathan, Song Yi, Jin Young, and me uh, doing this for about half a year. And um, this is our client. Uh, her name is Fatima, and she lives in Songi. Where was she from? Where's uh, Fatima? From Mali. From, from Mali. Songi met her there um, last year when she worked in World Vision. Um, and she lives in a refugee camp, and she doesn't have banking, she doesn't have a birth certificate. Uh, she cannot even go to Western Union or something like that because of that. Her husband is in another country, and he earns money there. And he just gives money to people that speak the same language and go into that direction and hopes that the money arrives. And we thought um, cryptocurrencies where people can control their own funds um, are a way to solve that. And Fatima, she has a $5 like old Nokia 100 phone. And our objective is to make something out of that. So uh, this is about remittance. Um, so uh, we have a simple system that basically allows you to um, transmit Bitcoin via SMS. It, it works very much like M-Pesa, except it's not driven by the network provider. Uh, what it is driven by, it's driven by a decentralized uh, system of what we call gateways. Gateways are a little bit more advanced phones. They're Android phones that are connected to the internet, and they basically bridge between SMS and the internet. And now everyone's saying, yes, yes, this is so unsecure, don't do that. Um, we, we have a few security measures, uh, a second factor, basically, um, that allows to secure that transaction. It's still not perfect, I understand that. Um, we see this as a beginner wallet, as a spending wallet that will never probably hold more than 50 bucks a person. So, um, basically what we do is we interlink the caller ID uh, of the phone and um, we provide a second factor for the user. The caller ID is something that he has. And um, this, uh, the user can get a call from our system and he has to set up a four digit pin, something only he remembers. And we basically map these two different um, factors of authentication to different keys on the blockchain. Distribute those keys between different companies <laughs> and have the um, user trust that these two companies don't collude. So this is the security model for, for this very simple approach. Um, so this is, what there is, um, this is our first product. From there on, uh, we go on and on our multi-signature platform that we have, we provide additional services. Soon, for example, Android devices will be $20, $30 maybe in price. That's a huge market of like billions of people that we can bring these wallets to. And we want them. We want them to be as simple as possible. So let me go through. 
I'll just step a, a go a little bit back. Um, we started this in December. Before December, um, I had a background. I worked at IBM. I did a little bit, little bit of security and scaling there. Um, and um, I traveled a lot. Um, I lived for a long time in Cambodia, where I had a business partner, and that's kind of where this idea also comes from. Uh, this business partner, before he earned sixty dollars a month, so I decided to pay him a hundred. I'm like, okay, that's a lot more. But he ended up broke every time on the second day of the month. Of it. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing? And he's like, yeah, I had to send this to my cousin, or my motorbike broke, or something like that. There was always an excuse. Our uh, bottom line, he just didn't know how to save money. Like, there is no concept of like individual ownership or control or something there. Everything belongs to everyone, and money flows very easily as well. So I opened a bank account for him, and things got a little bit better. He was so proud to hold that document, and he actually put some money in and then he spent it uh, bit by bit, and that helped a lot. So. Our vision is really to go out there and uh, to teach financial literacy using simple tools that we can provide with Bitcoin. And at the same time, basically in first time in history, allow people to hold their own money, digital, like money they can send, not just cash, like in cash-based societies, but money that they can send abroad or receive from abroad. Okay, so... Uh, when we started that and we decided that we need multi-signature, we also had very specific requirements. There was Electrum out there that was doing multi-sig. Um, there was another implementation, um, but um, our service is specifically for, has to run on an Android device. So it needed to be a very efficient and small implementation. The only thing that we could use was really Bitcoin J. We went out there and we looked at the library and there was no uh, HD wallets implemented and no multi-sig. So we I don't know when this was, I think it's about two months ago. Um, yeah, that wasn't plug and play. Um, uh, three of the companies that were in the accelerator um, put together some Bitcoins and we started this uh, bounty program basically to get Bitcoin J, uh, the necessary tools that we needed for our infrastructure. And um, I think for about a month, nothing happened at all. And um, then suddenly things started moving because I did like a prototype implementation, others looked at it, and it started evolving. And um, one guy that we're working uh, together now, his name is Konstantin, uh, it's a guy from Russia, he um, basically helped me to get most of the implementation into the repository. Um, let me show you his face real quick. <laughs> that, that's Konstantin. And uh, yeah, we worked together on this for the last I think two months, yeah. Um, so for today, and this is something that I've uh, just written up to kind of organize my thoughts. It's a small, it's not a paper, it's more like an article because I didn't really invent anything. Um, but I want to uh, publish this real soon and it's kind of a draft. It's meant for um, an audience of developers um, to really at the stage where you heard about Bitcoin and you maybe have done some stuff with APIs or with uh, Bitcoin D, um, but you really want to get into it and you want to write multi-signature applications, not just the plain old stuff where Coinbase or some other third party is holding, um, holding the funds, but you really want to um, provide applications that are, that for example, use an Oracle and use multi-party voting between the Oracle and the uh, wallet of the user or something like that. And I think it's really, there have been some presentations here about multi-sig. I think um, Mike Belchi from BitGo was here. I saw a video. And Ryan, where is he? Oh, Ryan is Singer? That? Okay. Um, they talked about multi-sig um, as a solution. And I really just want to present this as a development platform for developers. So um, bear with me. At the end, it's really as simple as implementing one interface or two interfaces, um, and then you are ready to go um, to do this kind of stuff. Um, let me think real quick. So uh, basically it's broken down into um, explaining uh, the op multi uh, check multi-sig um, code, uh, the, the op code that is really used in the script, then pay to script hash, 
Um, that's what I would go through. Um, Nathan, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> so, Nathan is, yeah, Nathan, introduce yourself. Nathan is a contractor, has been working with us for the last uh, three months. Guys. Um, has been helping with all kind of stuff from translation to implementation and to technical support. Yeah, yeah. and um, <clears throat> I think if you want to go about uh, through pages script hash awesome. and uh, HD wallets using this this one thing here, and I'll just correct you every time. Yeah, okay, <laughs> right. So uh, I I figure I don't quite understand the reference implementation totally. But I do un understand the three technologies that this is based on. Uh, married wallets doesn't actually do anything especially new. It simply takes these three, uh, these three items here, the three bips, uh, are already extant out of the wild and everything, and puts them together to fit an increasingly common use case. People want a third party that they can rely on for trust. Anyway, we all know about multi-sig. Uh, basically, allows you to take to apply or require two signatures for a Bitcoin transaction, right? Mm. Uh, yeah. Um, so if you, if you look at two transactions, they all structured the same way. You have inputs and outputs in transactions. And uh, the inputs have to be at, at least as much as the outputs. Okay. If they are more than everything that kind of, um, all the value that is um, in addition goes to the miners. They can claim everything. So if you want to pay a fee of whatever, what is it, 0.1 uh, millibit, then you just have an input that is 0.1 millibit bigger than, um, or all the inputs are together 0.1 milli, uh, millibit bigger than the output. And then the output contains the script. That is the logic to actually spend it later. Usually just when you publish a transaction, the transaction output is unspent. And then eventually later, when a new transaction comes into the blockchain, there is an input that matches it and uh, a script sig, and the script sig contains um, the solution to the problem to, s uh, to spend that output. Um, and of course it has then another output and so on and so on. So um, this is the general um, transaction. And the important thing um, about the script for multi-sig is this. Uh, it's the opcode. Can you increase the size? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's already increased. There you go. Um, so here's a simple uh, multi-sig uh, uh, script. It says um, opcode two, which means just like um, two out of the following three keys, uh, public keys. And this just says that it's three public keys in total. And all this is pushed onto a stack. Bitcoin itself, when it evaluates script, the script is something that is included in every transaction. These are, of course, mnemonics. The actual scripts are just hex values. Yeah, right. Um, it, it works with a stack machine. And every time a script is there, it just goes through the stack machine. And at the end, the result is false or true. And false is an invalid operation. And true allows you to spend <coughs> that stuff. So uh, the magic here. Go on. So this has to be evaluated before anyone can actually spend the bitcoins. Right. And the op, uh, check multisig operation um, before BIP11 was not a standard transaction. So you couldn't use it on the blockchain. Non-standard transaction means it's not relayed by miners and it will never basically be integrated into the blockchain. BIP11 introduced that as a, multi, uh, as a standard transaction and op check multisig just verifies that the signatures that are given in the script signature in the spending transaction in the input here actually um, in, um, like match the public keys. So signatures are generated by private keys and you can verify them with a public key. Okay, what's the next thing? Um, BIP16, wanna try now? Oh, Hopefully this isn't all totally familiar to you guys already, but yeah, we figured it'd be worthwhile to just go over it quickly. Uh, so the Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 16, and this is here, uh, basically moves the responsibility for evaluating a specific script from the person who is sending the transaction to the person who is receiving the transaction. So if you want to specify that you're going to pay, uh, that, you, that you need all of these signatures along with your payment, currently the sender is the person who has to specify all those, those people. The responsibility for getting everyone to evaluate them is also on him because uh, if you have too many evaluations where you 
you need to check them, do check multi-sig operations. Uh, it's a little bit more costly. It's weirder. You have to have an actually upgraded client and everything else. So your fee may need to be a little bit higher for the fee that you charge for a transaction. So what pay to script hash allows is for people to pay, basically pay to a script. Uh, to now you may notice that, script. Uh, yes, to a hash script. <laughs> But you may notice that the, the, the hyphens are all right here. So it's actually a pay to script hash, not pay to a, paying to a script hash. Oh, but you can see it either way, honestly. <laughs> Interesting uh, stuff. <laughs> so any, anyway, you can, uh, so what, what it basically means is that you can make a really, really complicated script that the, that the other person may not even know about and just give them this, the hash of this script and the person spending money to you doesn't need to know whether or not it's a, it's a script, or it's an address, or you're sending money off to your grand, half the money off to your grandmother automatically, whatever else. Uh, right. Any okay. Questions? So that, uh, when that, um, so here you have a simple um, uh, uh, the script that you do, and uh, notice that this always has the same length now because the hash is always 20 bytes, and you can easily represent that as an address as well. So those are the addresses that start with a three. And don't be fooled, it doesn't mean that it's always a multi-sig script. It can just be a regular spend script. So, um, but when you see a three in any address in Bitcoin, it is a pay to script hash. But what the script is, is not said. The script then is only provided later when, uh, when, this, uh, when the claiming transaction comes in. And that script for pay to script hash um, is the signatures that are related and then the serialized script that was used. So exactly the object multi-sig that we talked about before. And um, this has a few advantages, as Nathan mentioned, that actually now the sender doesn't need to pay the fee for the like many kilobyte. It's the guy that spends it later has to pay for it. Um, let me see if there's anything else that I want to You may be wondering whether or not you can actually put uh, <coughs> another hash of another script inside of another script, teaching it all style. That, that doesn't actually work. You can't make giant recursive scripts. Is, is it not? Very intentionally so. In fact, there was a bug in the initial implementation that was under another name where it accidentally allowed recursive evaluation. Uh, yes. It's very difficult to allow recursive evaluation to be sure what the memory computation budget next to is. Yeah, exactly. No loops allowed. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> on to the next one. Um, what did I do? Yes, you just. Uh, the third one is BIP32. I think I lost this. Oh, yeah. <coughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, let me show you. Just uh, Who's the author of BIP32? Good question. Yeah, Peter. Set up. Peter. Ah, Peter. This is the problem. Yes. So Richard Kiss talked about this, I think, at the last uh, yeah. BIP32. Yeah, we had a, a few of the 32 presentations here. So Basically, we don't want to bore you, right? Uh, yeah, I, I'm assuming, who, who all here have third, heard of BIP32? I mean, okay, next one. <laughs> all right, so, <laughs> all right, yeah. So we can derive all these keys and that is great. So what? Um, so it's really important to marry laws. Shadow will actually get that. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, let me just do one sentence. Um, BIP32 allows you, um, in comparison to the old bag of key implementations that the Satoshi client had, where you had to do regular backups for every now and then when you actually spend your look ahead of keys, um, BIP32 allows you to take one seed uh, of entropy and use it to derive like almost an infinite amount of addresses. And these addresses are structured the way that you can actually um, allow visibility to parts of the tree. So you can export uh, extended public keys and give them to other people, or you can export even extended private keys, and those are basically like sub-wallets. Um, and people are able to follow and like synchronize wallets, even though they're completely distinct instances running on different uh, devices, just being connected to the blockchain. Eric, can we tighten that up a little bit? Well, the key point that's important here is this kind of remarkable property that other people can generate addresses for you. They can generate new addresses all on their own using some data you gave them and generate an infinite number of addresses for you without your further cooperation. This uses a homomorphic and property of elliptic curve. 
cryptography. Mm, I have a question. Would that also be possible with RSA keys? Like, would you be able to, having a kind of like a chain code and RSA keys, be able to do key derivation on public keys as well? Uh, it's obvious what I'm thinking of would work. There may be a way to do it. I'm not aware of it. Yeah, I was just writing about them somewhere here. I wasn't sure. It works because the additive law on what occurs is complete. So it doesn't, that doesn't hold for our standards. But um, there may be a way to do it for our standards. Okay. But that was the that was the sort of key thing that inspired the creation of Bit32. You could have other people create public keys for you, which enables a bunch of applications, including the security laws. Yeah. Um, the most popular application is probably a web server where you sell stuff. And you can have the extended public key there and generate addresses for each product, which are then paid. But if someone actually hacks the server, they don't find any private keys. It basically, for those of you familiar with Unix, it allows for sort of a crude permission system around the keys. Okay. So, um, um, how do we um, create married wallets in Bitcoin J? Um, we take three different wallet instances that have different seeds. So they will all generate different keys. And we export extended public keys from a certain account in that wallet. This, um, and then these extended public keys are shared between all the other instances of the wallet. I have an example of three here. You could do two as well. Uh, you could do five, I think, but it's still not standard. Um, or 17 or whatever. Uh, but we will keep the example with three. So um, I have the extended public key here, and I export it from wallet A, and I import it into B and C. And what happens then? Does you right click. Ah, it's right click. But you were right click. Thank you. Um, this is a nice one. So. Um, let me explain the notation for, you all know it, I think. Uh, the lowercase m stands for private key. The uppercase m stands for a public, or an extended public key. And then I just derive different addresses here in the different wallet. Uh, so this one has a master um, private key, and I derive um, an account from it. And then I've imported the other two, as you know. And what I can basically do is I can <coughs> create a tuple of public keys for every, uh, every spot in the keychain. And as Gregory said, that allows me to generate uh, addresses. Um, but in this case, I don't generate addresses in terms of like hashes of public keys. I generate addresses that are paid to script hash. And um, I can do that in any position of the wallet after I have done the import, except for private derivations. We're not talking about that here. <laughs> Um, these, by the way, are known are now known in the the host wallet as shadow or following keys. Yeah, from a shadow or following. Key yeah, chain. we talked about shadowing a little bit for naming. Now they're called following keys, and the ones that have a private key uh, in the implementation are called are called follow keys. Um, so I can generate different addresses. So apparently now I can fund the wallet, and uh, there will be a balance generated for it. And what I can also do um, is, I don't know, it's described right here. What I can also do is, of course, signing. But as you see, uh, the private keys are still in the three different instances of the wallet. So um, there needs to be logic that kind of gets all the signatures together. And that's the thing that we have simply or dumped down in married wallets in Bitcoin J. Um, you don't need to take care of all of this. The only thing that you need to take care of is the initial exchange of extended public keys and then collecting the signatures. That's really everything that it comes down to. And that's the thing that I want to present today. So, pluggable signers. Ah, yeah. Now we come to the signers. And I will just t uh, take you into Eclipse and I uh, will go a little bit through the code. and. Please jump in and have any questions. And if you can't see stuff, then come closer. Um, so, um, <laughs> <laughs> you can come back to us. Yeah. I think you cannot zoom in Eclipse, right? Has any one of you tried? Um, where would I even do that? 
You could try doing the controls. Uh, control plus, right? Yeah. No, no the, I'm, try, I'm control, trying. Control scroll. zoom. Control scroll. Like put two fingers on the track. Uh, but if you have to, scroll. you have to enable it in OSX. Yeah. You, you might. Turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, I have the keyboard. Like control. Okay, I'm not gonna. Uh, Decide where you, I do. you move your mouse and it'll follow the window. Ah, yeah. sweet. Okay, not to the right though. Uh, uh, yeah, you have to push it a little bit. Okay. Uh, um, so this is the. I guess you might change the display resolution, and it's a little bit weird because I have two screens. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So maybe it's better to change this to mirroring. Uh, yeah. Cool. Then I can actually see what I'm doing. Yeah. Thank you. You might want to zoom out. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but still, OK, yeah. It's just an interface. The other ones are more complicated. Is that readable? No. Much better. OK. Uh, so this is just the transaction signer interface. And the signer needs a little bit of state. So when you just. Imagine you have a wallet and let's say it has a bunch of signers for different services. There is like BitGo, CryptoCore, uh, Green Address and whatnot in your Android wallet, right? So um, w once uh, an instance of the signer is generated, it needs to uh, first of all re retrieve the extended public keys and um, like somehow hook up to your account and maybe save what kind of account you have and so on. And um, this is the um, uh, this is the is ready uh, call. So it's not just at the beginning when it's created; it's also every time when it's retrieved from uh, when the wallet was serialized and comes back up. Uh, then we need to know that the signer is okay again; that it has the data that is required for signing. Um, Okay, and the other interface is apparently sign inputs. And we have uh, the transaction itself that we're talking about, all the transaction uh, outputs that are there, and redeem data. And redeem data is a collection of keys and redeem scripts that are related to the transaction. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's just go to the simple signer and I'll show you. So this is the signer that signs um, standard transactions in Bitcoin G. Those are all of the other ones that are not related to multi-sig. So uh, we just make sure that um, this is not a, a simple pager script hash um, um, transaction. And we make sure that um, it, there is only one key. Then we know that it's either the one or the other one. Then we know that it's a standard transaction. If there is more than Usually a multi-sig transaction has at least two keys and, and, and the script, and the redeem script. Um, I will not bore you with the standard transactions because that's what happens on Bitcoin all the time. Um, and then the next thing that is, and that is an abstract implementation yet, um, that is the page script. Can I actually, oh yeah, okay. Um, that's to, uh, the page script hash transaction signer and um, this one is pretty simple, it just always returns true. If you would want to build a service on top of that, um, like let's say you want to build a BitGo or Crypto or, or Green Address, um, this is the class that you would extend and modify according to your specification. And um, what it does, it basically iterates over all the outputs and it tries to sign them uh, with keys that it has. Um, yeah, so if there is no signature, it will just go ahead and ask the wallet back if the wallet knows um, uh, the key. And to do so, it basically, um, the wallet in Bitcoin J is structured that it has a keychain group and different keychains in there. And we have modeled this, um, this system of 
uh, followed and following keychains, right? And it would just ask the group, and the group in uh, in return would look what is the active keychain, and it would retrieve um, the key that is followed that has a private key and a public key, and it would retrieve the one or two or three other ones that only have public uh, public keys. <coughs> And for every um, key that is a following key, uh, it wouldn't be able to do the signature. So it would call into um, to this abstract uh, function here that is get their signature. And um, the thing that I want to um, show you today that we actually want to execute is um, is um, this uh, test uh, transaction signer. And it does nothing more than um, it calls to a server that runs uh, on the same machine, and um, it gets it gets a signature for all the outputs that are missing. <coughs> oh gosh, and where is actually? Let me find you the. Uh, I think I didn't even import that project. Um, so the server is very, um, very stupid in what it does, and it just always signs a transaction. Um, we use that for development because that's what you need. You just always want to get a signature, and then um, um, once you have enough signatures collected, you execute the transaction and um, put it on the blockchain. Um, uh, what is important here? Uh, there's a second function here, which is um, get their signatures. Oh uh, no, get their signature. Get partner watch key. And that is the function that is used during initially during the uh, setup where we get all the extended public keys, like we saw in that graphic, where you export all the extended public keys. So, what have I done? Um, I basically. Oh gosh. Never used this before. I have a Bitcoin D running here. Um. And I funded it a little bit, so uh, no, I didn't fund this one. Um, what I've done is I've created an address before in the um, in the wallet that we looked at with the two different signers, and I funded that address. So now we can go ahead and actually spend from that multi-sig into a regular address back to my Bitcoin D. So here is you see the outgoing um, uh, the outgoing transaction. Let me take that thing out. Right here, outgoing transaction, and it doesn't go to an M address, which would be the testnet. It goes to an address that starts with a two. That's equivalent to the three on the production network. And um, what I want to show you now, real quick, is the wallet client. And this is where we actually use Bitcoin J. And I think it's it would be interesting to talk about it a little bit because Bitcoin J is very modularized and allows you to handle like um, things really, really well. I just like the interface there. So um, what I do first is I set up my, uh, my keychain here. I use, I use password as a seed. Don't do that in real life. <laughs> um, and then I set up a keychain group from that password. I set the look ahead size. That just means how many keys are generated to make sure that we don't um, miss out on transactions that happen somewhere else. Um, into that uh, keychain group, um, uh, from that keychain group, I will get the active keychain. That's a concept in Bitcoin J that's quite interesting as well. So there is an active uh, keychain, and you can actually deactivate the active keychain, and a new one will be generated for you. That process is called key rotation. So if you have a feeling that your seed was exposed, or something's funky, or you just want to migrate away from a multi-sig service that you use and start using another one. You do a keychain rotation. And a keychain rotation is a thing where all the inputs that you have before a certain date or before a certain key are spent and are sent uh, to, a new uh, to a new key or to a new address that was generated from another seed, let's say, or that was just in date generated after the specific time. It's a kind of a maintenance state in the wallet, but you can do interesting things with it where, let's say you start with a two out of two multi-sig, where only two instances are relevant of the wallet, and then the user 
comes along and he says, now I have an Android device. And um, I want to hold keys here as well. Um, he exports the extended public key and you rotate all his funds in two, and two out of three. And now he can use his desktop computer, his mobile wallet, and some like security service on the web to do these kind of things. Would this need to be done if someone was switching from one wallet protection service to another? Yeah, so I'll, uh, the, ob the objective of um, the design document that um, Mike has written for married wallets is that you can marry your wallet, your existing wallet, uh, uh, to um, let's say a risk management service like Bitco, and you can unmarry as well. And these would be two key uh, keychain rotations where you go from single keys to an active keychain that has following keys and then back uh, to a keychain that again has just simple keys. Um, okay, so uh, we get the watching key and we serialize it. Um, and keep, oh, we never use that one, okay. <laughs> um, uh, we create a, the test transaction signer that I've just shown you before. And um, we add the following account key here uh, from signer get partner watch key. Oh, this has all the logic to uh, call the server and get the key. Let me see if I started that already. Um, the server's running. Um, and then there is a cool thing that is. Um, so apparently here I create the wallet and I um, put in the keychain that, that, um, that I was working before. I add the transaction signer that is necessary to some printouts here. Um, I create a block store. This is a simple in-memory block store, so things are never uh, saved on, on the disk or anywhere, but it's great for testing. And I create what is a peer group. And a peer group is basically a socket and it has all the logic that is necessary to talk to the um, blockchain and do stuff with it. So, um, and yeah, so uh, you can decide which network you connect to, it gives you events, you can listen for transactions and so on with a peer group. And actually, just having a peer group is enough. You don't need a wallet and, uh, um, and a blockchain necessarily. If you just wanna know what's in memory, that's cool. Later you can at attach a, uh, a block store and build like an index database of uh, open transaction outputs. And then eventually, if you also want to hold coins with your service, then you attach a wallet and do stuff with it. Um, I just do some stuff. I really uh, want to just download the wallet from a certain time on. I create a new address on the wallet to make sure that it uh, creates the key look ahead. I will display the balance real quick after it's synchronized. Um, oh no, I will display the address real quick before it's synchronized. And here is um, the spending that I actually want to do with you guys. So uh, we will see how much balance is in the wallet. And then uh, we will create a send request. And I'm just um, spending to a regular address here that starts with an M and I spend one cent, which is 10 millibit, back to that address. Um, I will call complete, address, uh, complete transaction, which will sign the transaction. And then I, uh, once the transaction is signed, I just tell the peer group that it should broadcast it. And um, yeah, I think that would be, I think we'll just try it. So the wallet started up, it gave me an address, 2NC something. And you see percentages, so it just downloads all the block headers. Um, I think what would be relevant to mention is that Bitcoin J can run as an SPV client, um, simplified payment verification. So it doesn't need to download all the blocks. Apparently we're not downloading 20 gigabytes right now. It just gets the headers and um, that's also why we chose the Bitcoin J implementation because we need to run this on very old Android devices. Basically like shelf devices that we want to make small servers that people can run in their community. And whenever someone sends a text message to the phone number of that device, he gets a response and says, hello, this is your 37 coins wallet. Here are the commands to use it. And 
um, yeah, that, that's what we're using this stuff for. We also have some flyers. <laughs> I'm just waiting until it's done. <laughs> so, um, we want to help people hold their own money. And I think the SMS is a very, like, simple solution to do so, be, especially because you can push out stuff. Uh, so you don't need to have an application installed, or you don't need to know what an address is. Um, you can just push out a wallet to someone and say, here are some funds for you. And um, we have this, uh, the, this thing here, um, which is basically do your, do your own bank. You just fold it and it's a small device like that. And it has instructions on how to use the wallet on the bank. So it's like address, balance, send, receive, and so on. It doesn't mean that people always have to use SMS for um, their wallet and it probably wouldn't be the most secure thing um, because there are still attack vectors on the second factor that I mentioned to you where actually if the provider is able to read your text messages and listen to your calls, then he would be able to break into your wallet and steal stuff. Uh, we're working on that and we try to do something um, uh, that would use biometrics. Uh, during, uh, where you just are challenged with a word and you have to pronounce it during the phone call and that way we um, uh, we would be able to authenticate you and it wouldn't be reproducible by anyone who kind of intercepts the phone call at least it wouldn't be easy so this is what we're working on but it's basically an outbound marketing tool so um, uh, you send some funds to a person that never heard about Bitcoin before and now they have them already and they're interested in what to do with it. And we um, provide like white label solutions for local partners that provide liquidity. Like think of it like as a local coin desk in the Philippines or in Vietnam or something like that. And uh, their, uh, their website and maybe an application that you can download or something like that is in the SMS and it, um, it kind of intends to send the user back to the website and have them use a more secure solution, an Android uh, wallet or a website wallet or something like that. Um, okay, so... You have a question? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was wondering really quick, what, in, what inspired you initially after working with the 30, on the 37 Coins project to get involved in something like uh, making multisig easier to implement? Ah, okay. That's a good question. Uh, basically, our partners. So uh, we have some partnerships set up in Southeast Asia, and these companies basically uh, take either the Android solution or a web gateway solution, and they provide the SMS service to certain customers. And they want to make sure that they also have control over the funds, uh, that we cannot just run away with it. So we have this solution where we have one key on the, uh, on the partner server, one key on our server, and then once the user basically like grows up from SMS and uses something else, which we really encourage them to do, then they get a key as well. Um, okay, so um, what happened here? We have a little bit of output. Um, it, it says that it received a transaction. I don't know if that's maybe an old transaction or something like that. Um, but uh, if I go to my Bitcoin D and I list the previous transaction, I should see that now I receive 0.1 in my transaction history. Uh, just do list transactions here. Uh, okay, and I don't see it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So this is still the one that I've spent before and I don't know, I've tested that before, but um, maybe it tells me that I have insufficient funds. Check, see, people verify. So it talks a lot about receiving transactions, and right now I don't have the outgoing transaction. Interesting. Yeah, maybe I've played too much today. Um, yeah, that, that apparently failed. <laughs> It works, as you've seen before, there were some incoming transactions for multi-seek addresses. Um, so this is really what I want, wanted to show you. It's as simple as implementing this one interface with two functions to start and write applications that are multi-seek. You can imagine it very simple, where you are like a risk management system. You could do something like cosine, where there are actually three different instances of wallets, two, three, four, or five, 
basically you have a cosign wallet with your friends. Uh, you can as well implement maybe like a blockchain poker or something like that if you manage to um, integrate an oracle that provides random numbers or something like that. And I think um, that was that was a really interesting um, article. Um, or let's go back to um, there is a really interesting um, project that out there that is called Orisi, and they try to do um, oracles on the blockchain. Basically, um, they also use the multi-signature for that, and they have different instances of uh, servers that evaluate stuff cryptographically secure, or that just vote on outcomes. And the simplest uh, um, way to um, implement an oracle is just to spend something in the future, for example. Let me see, they have a list here of what, this, what the stuff is that they want to achieve. Um, so that's the, the time lock. Another um, thing that would be interesting for the blockchain, in the blockchain you only have incoming transactions, right? And maybe like they're sorted by time and that's the only cryptographic security that you get, but wouldn't it be nice to have information from outside of the blockchain? For example, the BTC price, and if you could do like bets on it or something like that. And um, because the blockchain, un unlike Ethereum, <laughs> doesn't do all kind of uh, cryptographic uh, or cannot is not Turing complete, um, it is it is difficult to implement all of them, like different kinds of applications. So a voting pool. Let's not call it voting pool. Uh, joint control, like in multi-signature, plus the oracle concept, allows us to kind of have the next best solution on the blockchain. And I think with just needing to implement an interface, uh, you can start like building building an oracle today. It's as simple as that. Um, so these guys they want to publish the BTC price, a BTC price that you can trust in. Um, check different websites for like keywords, if something happened in politics or something like that. Um, and publish all kind of data feeds um, on, onto the blockchain that you can then subscribe and make your applications work with. Um, design notes. Um, another thing that I wanted to point out, um, I'm kind of coming to the end so I expect a lot of questions now. <laughs> so. Another thing that um, Vitalik wrote about uh, multisig today, he published a blog entry, and um, he talks about different setups um, that are used in the industry and which ones he considers secure and which one he considers less secure. So you can implement multisig in where the user has a, a web wallet and he does one signature and then the signature is sent to the backend and the server signs with another signature. And um, Vitalik argues that that is secure in terms of the protocol, but it doesn't actually add any security for the user because um, if your server is compromised, it will deliver um, an application uh, that, um, that is modified um, that will probably like, talk about the keys. And then the backend is also uh, modified, and then it can spend your points to wherever it wants. So, um, you really need to either have like a Chrome plugin or in a, an application that is separate. And I think uh, CryptoCorp's main message is that you should always separate uh, the Oracle from all the client-side implementations and have people do the client-side implementations themselves. Is that right? <laughs> um, and um, I agree with that. Um, but um, yeah, I agree with that in general. And what we do in 37 points, uh, we, we basically have an Oracle on our side that does a second factor verification with, uh, um, with the phone user. And then we give that piece of application to a partner in that specific country that then looks at the code, starts running it, and also knows that it's cryptographically secure. But my opinion is that there is much more use cases than just risk analysis services multi-sig out there and that's why I, we kind of want to 
publish this not only as we did another multi-sig implementation, but here's a platform that you can use, just implement an interface and start building new applications like whatever you think of gambling, poker. Uh, I think WebRPC and multi-sig would work great together. Um, um, yeah, so that's my message. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about here is that I also think it's very important that as a Bitcoin community, uh, we go ahead and put like a stress on sharing and on teaching specifically. The industry is really small and um, it's very easy to develop something and then keep it for yourself and try to establish kind of like a market advantage by just having this implementation. And I see that in a lot of projects, specific solutions are developed, be it for Bitcoin D or be it for Bitcoin J. Companies claim that they have HD multi-sig implementations out there, um, but I don't see anything in the repositories. It's not contributed back. I think Mike Hearn has a really cool project, the Lighthouse uh, stuff that he's doing, that kind of gives a solution to it, uh, because it allows developers to be funded for what, for what they're doing, or at least they can, they can raise money for it. Uh, but I think just in overall, we should kind of embrace like teaching and putting the solutions into repositories first and then using them. And that's exactly the advantage we want to get from uh, implementing uh, married wallets in Bitcoin J. Uh, Mike Hearn looked at that. A lot of other developers looked at the implementation. Um, and we, cannot, we can be sure that at least there is something to it. If there are bugs fixes in the future, we profit from it. If there are enhancements in, in the logic, we profit from it. So I think it really should be in the repositories first, and then we go ahead and use it. And I think that is also the thing that my paper uh, <coughs> closes on. Um, I also wanted to talk about um, open. Do I still have time? or You still have time. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, there are some open tasks that still need to be done with this implementation, so I all invite you to participate. Um, what we don't have yet is um, storage for the signer. So uh, when, when you run your wallet on your Android device and you get a phone call, that's basically another application that comes into memory and maybe pushes your, your wallet out of memory. So it needs to serialize all the content, put it into the wallet file and basically stop running and then it comes back. If the signer happened to be signing something during that time, then we have a problem because that state is lost. So what we need to do is we need to make the signing process interruptible, serializable, and yeah, basically like make it persistable. Um, that is something that we don't ultimately need in our implementation right now, so I don't think we'll be pushing that. Um, but that would be um, very interesting to have. Um, and then, let me think, what else did I want to talk about? I had some... Uh, yeah, we are hiring. Um, so, 37 coins... <laughs> senior software. Uh, we search for a senior architect, basically. So, I'm good with... Um, I'm the only developer right now. I'm really good with like writing prototypes and get things to work one time, as you see, not two times. Um, and then, <laughs> then we need someone who can take that over and um, really make a product out of it. So this person we're searching right now, someone who has a, a lot of experience in product development, um, is good with agile development methods and so on. Um, and I know that's really hard to find here in the Valley because everyone's so busy. I'm just telling you. Maybe you know some. Um, yeah, and then... Um, I would like to, uh, that sounds weird kind of, but uh, <laughs> I just wrote this paper and I sent it to a lot of people and I got really good feedback from Mike Hearn, Mike Belshi and Ben from BitGo and a few more people that I've sent it out to, so just like to say that. And that's basically it. Is your paper in GitHub? Uh, not this? yet, but it, I will attach it to the event very soon and then it will be there. Still some spelling mistakes. <laughs> Are there any uh, are there any philosophical advantages to, to implementing something using the a little bit more standard definition that Mary Wallets has, rather than just going at it on your own? 
Um, I think there are all the advantages of not having extra effort. No. <laughs> um, there is still a long way to go to standardize the technology. FIP32 itself has, um, is not, how do you say, is very open. You can do so many things with it. So there are other um, Bitcoin improvement proposals, 43 and 44, uh, that kind of uh, give it a little bit more structure. And the what thing are that 43 and 44. Huh? What are 43? 43. Um, I think I, d I don't know exactly. <laughs> anyone wants to? Uh, anyone knows 43 and 44? Well, what they do is propose a standard wallet structure. Yeah. Uh, that narrows the space of how you can use BIP32 to make it a little easier to build a compatible implementation. Yeah, it's multi-account hierarchy for deterministic wallets. Yeah, I'm just trying to find the... The goal of BIP32 is to sort of superset all possible use cases, which is fantastic, yeah. except you're not going to implement all possible use cases in your application. Yeah. So... Exactly. Um, and very important. I really like the developer guide from Bitcoin.org. I think everything I know, I know from there. Um, and it also talks a little bit about the setup. Um, so, of the BIP32 as well. So that's a really good resource to use. Um, and then of course, if beyond that, that would be a standard for communication between different wallets. We have a serialized version of an extended public key that is pretty, um, pretty standardized. And that is good for the setup, apparent, uh, of course. Uh, I think there's nothing that well standardized for exchanging uh, signatures, actually. Um, so we just send the things around and we encode them. Um, but if wallets would actually be able to uh, talk to each other without, like, on a certain standard, even on the network layer, I think that would be really great. And I don't know if married wallets are exactly the point to start or any other implementation, but I think that's what the community needs to talk about. And that is something that is not related to the Bitcoin protocol itself, so I hope it's easier and faster to standardize than a new transaction output or something like that. Um, another thing that I noticed and that I really want to do is more advanced logic um, in transactions. So I would like to use uh, 12 mm -hmm. out of 17 multi-sig or do logic in there where I have nested multi like nested signature uh, nested multi-sig so where I say either my wallet or my backup or risk analysis system one or risk analysis system two or risk analysis system three without the ability that one two and three can collude against me um, um, I would like to be able to do that but this is a non non-standard transaction so in it currently um, up to 15 has become standard effect from like this month on, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, but would I be able to use logic with it, like op if and op else and so on? Um, uh, in as of in Git right now, you can have basically anything inside a P2SH script that will fit. Oh, really? Yeah. That's that's good update. Cool. So you can you can have some logic. There's there's also cases where some of those fancy compositions can be achieved by giving some signers multiple public keys and just using an N of M set. Uh -huh. So you can sometimes get like these two and these two and then one of these others just by adding up some extra keys in there. Cool. But yeah, that sounds interesting. <laughs> I'll look at that. Okay. Um, Any other uh, questions? Is there anywhere we can find out more information about this other um, than the document that we'll post you to? Yeah, um, I will, of course, publish the document. Uh, most of the implementation that we've done is in Bitcoin J already. Uh, what we'll commit the next days is the signers that I've shown you. But um, if if you take like these, everything like everything is working already. So we can set up the wallets, and there is a notion of a following keychain and a, a followed keychain, and so on. And it's in the master branch of Bitcoin J. So I think that will go out with the next. Um, with the next release, which I think is 0 0.13 or something like that. So what's the way to put it? I mean, uh, it looked like it, it used to be a part of Google or something. What is was it? it a Google project first and now? Ah, because it, so it, my, my it used to be over in Google, right? I mean, yes, yes, yes. So my current was a Google employee. Um, oh, okay. 
and he recently quit his job to work on the lighthouse, as I understand. And he now committed his time fully to Bitcoin. Oh, works on that. Um, so some of the classes still carry the com Google stuff, but I, I don't know if Google just because of the namespace Google does doesn't have any. Google has a policy, or still has a policy that any work being done by open source work done by Googlers has to be within my code about Google. Okay. So that's why I was saying Google code about Google. Okay. So my students to get that kind of stuff. Okay. But the license is, is it an Apache license? Or I'm sure it's, it? yeah. Yeah. Some yeah. yeah, so the license is Apache. So cool. cool. All right. Any other questions? Are we good? Uh, we could, you know, hang out after a bit, um, chat with Johan, and uh, I want to say thank you for just an awesome presentation and congratulations on bringing Mary Wallace to uh, the project. Nice work.